thank you so much for your kind in- invitation right? and for such an overwhelming introduction right so i am not a very die hard fan of using ppts in lectures so i i basically want to pose two questions to everyone out there why do we need new york convention why do we need new york convention or is it now only a tool to locate assets during the course of webinar i'll be briefly touching upon the overview of new york convention and i want you to think the analogy like right? how this change in jurisprudence has further evolved what why why new york convention was introduced and is it now serving its purpose this is the two fold question which i want to address during the course of my webinar i hope i am perfectly audible yes to begin with i do understand like you might feel webinars are now old school like it was good during the time of covid now people want to interact and meet personally right i think webinars will be a perfect example for understanding new york convention from my view firstly we should address what is new york convention is it a tool to recognize and enforce arbitral awards in a simpler language it means that you can enforce your awards anywhere around the globe subject to a assets and b a state should be a contracting state right similarly a webinar right you can meet anyone discuss your views with every, everyone be present anywhere virtually subject to internet connectivity and your willingness to learn right before we kick start the webinar right i want to pose like i have already posed a question like let's let's draw a map right a do we need a new york convention or b or should we change it or say like is it only it is only for asset location the new york convention is remarkably a short preview and that only seeks to achieve two things in short right that an arbitration agreement is respected to, throughout the globe and that the awards are enforced till now it can be assumed or rather we can presume its objectives are met right the new york convention makes the award a transportable in nature meaning the award can be enforced at any contracting state for example two international parties have a dispute they resorted to arbitration one of the parties have an award in their favor now the question comes of enforcement how do you enforce that award where you will in which courts you will go to enforce such kind of an award right to the new york convention has made it very easy you have to only look where are the assets right suppose in india suppose there are two parties a from england and b is from america right they have their arbitration suppose for example in singapore right the party in england won the arbitration right now the point is the party in england wants to enforce the award in which courts he or she should go the new york convention suggests that you can go in any country subject to availability of the assets that's the only meager requirement and b that particular country should be a contracting state we will come to the point of how new york convention has further fragmented it in a way in a manner right the first action is a recognition and enforcement of foreign awards that is an arbitral awards made in the territory of another state right this field of application is defined in article 1 of new york convention 
the general obligations for the contracting states to recognize such awards as a binding and to enforce them in accordance with their rules or procedure is laid down in Article 3 of the New York Convention. In Article 4, a party seeking enforcement of a foreign awards need to supply to the court A, the arbitral award, B, the arbitration agreement. It is a formal requirement. Right? Now comes the devil. The devil is Article 5. The party against whom the enforcement is sought right, can object to the enforcement by submitting proof of one of the grounds for refusal of enforcement, which are limited, of course, however, they are listed in Article 5. Right? Now, many of you would ponder upon the question, can enforcement, can the enforcing courts can again look into, into the merits of the case? Is it not for the courts situated at the seat, right? Who all were supposed to be in such event? For example, let, let me make it very clear, very easy for you. Now understand the arbitration process first, then we'll come to the New York Convention. Right? What is the first step? A. Both the parties should have an agreement. Right? At the time of disputes, the parties raising the dis dispute would invoke the arbitration clause. They will appoint an arbitrator. In case they are not reaching into a mutual name of an arbitrator, they will approach the respective courts or respective institutions. They will appoint the arbitrator. Right? Then the arbitrator would adjudicate upon the merits of the disputes right? and render an award. That award is technically binding upon both the parties. Once parties have the, the award, if the parties are aggrieved by the award, the party would go to the seat, the court at the seat and file and setting aside application that subject to XYZ conditions, subject to the grounds listed, list, enlisted and setting aside, this particular award should be challenged. The winning, suppose parties in the in the local courts, parties contest at section 30, 34 or for example, setting aside, the winning party, the, there are only two repercussions to it, right? Under the setting aside applications, the court has the generally now courts are taking two views majorly. A, either they will upheld the award given by the arbitrator or what they will do, they will set aside the award. Right? If they are upholding the award, now the question is, then subsequently the party can move for an enforcement of that particular award. Right? Enforcement, how enforcement can be done? They are the, it is a separate proceedings of enforcement. Right? Parties will go to the enforcement, the court at the enforce at the court where the assets are located, or the enforcement enforcement courts, and file an application that this is my award. I this this particular award it was given by an arbitration or arbitrator. Now I want to reap out the fruits of this particular award. Subsequently, the court ideally the court at enforcement enforcement should enforce the decree. This is how generally it is done, but in the cases where, suppose for example, the awards are set aside, New York Convention and the countries taking the help of New York Convention are also enforcing the awards which was set aside at the seat. The question is, can it be done? Answer to that is very limited, but the courts are taking such a view. In the course of further arguments, like we'll discuss more upon this particular aspect of New York Convention. Right? The party against whom enforcement is sought can object to the enforcement how they will invoke article 5 there are grounds enlisted therein and the parties challenging the enforcement will apprise the court that look boss there are this particular award is hit by 
आर्टिकल फाइव वन ए बी सी डी और ई द कोर्ट मे इट्स ऑन ओन मोशन रिफ्यूज इन्फोर्समेंट फॉर रीजन ऑफ पब्लिक पॉलिसी एज प्रोवाइडेड इन आर्टिकल फाइव टू इफ द अवार्ड इज सब्जेक्ट टू एन एक्शन फॉर सेटिंग अ साइड इन द कंट्री इन विच और अंडर द लॉ of which it is made the country of origin meaning thereby the court at the sea the foreign court before which the enforcement of the award is sought so may adjourn a decision on enforcement right finally if a party seeking enforcement prefers to base its request for enforcement on the court's domestic law on enforcement of a foreign award or bilateral or other multilateral treaties enforce in the country where it seeks enforcement it is allowed to do so by virtue of so called or more favorable right right internationally speaking awards are usually voluntarily complied right by the losing party unless right there is always a caveat unless the party is a habitual litigants and i tell you why because everyone everyone on earth Hates to pay interest. Right. The second action. See, you need to understand what does New York Convention suggest. It is not only for enforcement. It is also for recognition. A, you have to recognize the award, and then only you can enforce it. Right. It is necessary to state that the New York Conventions is a is still evolving. Right. Which is still taking place even in the present day, and therefore it is still debatable whether the New York Convention was intended to be a thorough design, or it is just a tool to regulate the recognition and enforcement of an international law. It is still debatable, and it is still evolving from time to time. Right? Today we have see you need to understand this international arbitration, right? there are various stakeholders they are stakeholders are not only litigants there are arbitrators in place there are lawyers in place there are scholars in place who are on a daily basis like right, doing research like right, giving interpretations and it is a result why we say that it is still evolving we don't have a clear cut answer like how do we limit the extent of new york convention what it was supposed to do earlier it was enforced to recognize the and earlier it was brought into place for recognition for the recognition in, in, and enforcement now the question comes is if the award is already set aside can you enforce it many of you would say no but there is a french court which has said yes you can if we go further right the new york convention talks about how it talks about three things right and you need to understand how this particular things come into place a recognition it is a legal process by which award is integrated into a domestic legal system no matter how international your your arbitration is or your award award may be at the end of the day you have to enforce it within the contours of your domestic law it it is an international award yes it is it is it might be an international arbitration so what end of the day you will have to resort to your domestic law for the enforcement now the question comes is is your domestic law is in sync with the new york convention or the best practices of the world there is an ongoing debate everywhere around the globe like singapore is a pro arbitration jurisdiction india is trying to be a pro arbitration jurisdiction america is a pro arbitration jurisdiction germany is pro arbitration jurisdiction right england is pro arbitration jurisdiction right dubai you now people are moving towards dubai for Dubai for their arbitrations. Why? Because of the favorable domestic 
legal system. You need to understand why the Singapore legal system has two arbitration acts. One is national and one is international. Why? To minimize the interference of the courts. We all need to come together and try to answer the question is arbitration, is dispute, is only about a favorable arbitration? Answer to that is no. End of the day, you have to realize what parties eventually want. Are you suggesting, yes, I will spend a number, a huge amount of money for a good arbitration, but what about the enforcement of the award? What will you do with a paper decree? You have an award, but how do we enforce it? Is it only about arbitration? No. It might be, but how will you attain the fruits of your arbitration? For that, it comes to enforcement. No matter how favorable or how you are facilitating, as in how, in how vast and how robust infrastructure of, of facilitating the arbitration you are making, it will be of no use if you don't have an effective mechanism for enforcement of an award. Right? For enforcement, you need to understand it is necessary that enforcement proceedings are separate from proceedings initiated for setting aside of an arbiter. During the time of enforcement proceedings, the judge is not supposed to go behind the decree. The judge cannot give a new analysis to the facts. Right? Everyone might have in their law schools or in their practice and in their respective jurisdictions have heard. Right? And enforcement proceedings and a setting aside proceedings are two different and B it is not an appellate mechanism it is not an appeal where you can go and reappreciate the evidences reappreciate the facts substitute the judgment of the of an arbitrator no you can't do so you, you cannot go behind that decree in set aside you are you still have a scope where you can see that okay the arbitrator might have done something wrong might have right subject to public policy subject to perversity subject to x number of limitations the point is can you do such a thing during the enforcement proceedings as well you might agree and say no you can't but the question is, what does your Article 5 suggest in your convention? To a larger extent, your Article 34 in Ancestral Model Law and Article 5 of New York Convention are almost similar. For example, suppose for example, you have an arbitration award. The grief party moves to a setting aside application, moves a setting aside application in the seat of arbitration. Right? That seat of arbitration will check whether you are check all the threshold of Article 34. Right? And there can be two opinions to it. Either they will upheld it or they will set it set aside, set it aside. For example, they upheld the award. The courts at the seat upheld the award. Now, the party, what is the next step for the party? The party would come in the court where the assets are located at the enforcement courts and would file for enforcement. Right? Now, the losing party, again, on the same grounds, will move objections under Article 5. I have one question. Why you are doing that? And B, how you can do so? 
what about the gen general phenomenon of res judicata what about stoppel are you now again saying to the courts at enforcement no no boss still the award is not final arbitrator has given the award i have lost over there i have moved a section 34 application still i have i i lose over there and again at the courts of again at the step again at the stage of enforcement i will again move an objections on the same grounds why is it a trial error method uh, is that is is for that why new york convention was at first brought in place the question to that is nobody really knows what to do about it to me it is very surprising with with the limited knowledge which with what i have like how can you relitigate issues again and again then what is the point of having arbitration at the very first place if we delve deep into article 5 clause 1 we can easily look at two parts one enforcement court should decide on the enforceability of arbitral award rendered it in foreign jurisdiction and second the courts of the country of origin to set aside that particular arbitral award if the case suggests so the courts must recognize arbitrations agreement unless refusal to do so is warranted under article 2 itself right such an objection must be raised by the party contesting the agreement's validity there is no review under article 2 right article 3 provides that courts shall recognize and enforce arbitral awards in the same spirit because article 2 creates a presumption of validity of an arbitration agreement with respect to the possibility of course refusing to refer the parties to arbitration right parties now let's see the import of article 5 parties resisting the awards invokes article 5 the rationally is broadly the protection of defendant's right to the due process now my question is why you are concerned to protect your right again during the time of enforcement just because you are under a new domestic framework if if suppose for instance you have already you are already here at the course of enforcement aren't you are are aren't you really litigating those issues which you probably have lost over there same parties same cause of action what else do we need for a suit like technically the same court over, over here they are not article 5 contributes to the effectiveness <clears throat> of international arbitration by enhancing trust in the system on the part of arbitration arbitrating parties right article 5 may not be used as a de facto appeal mechanism but the question is right why if you are not if you are saying that article 5 should not be used as a de facto appeal mechanism then why most of the grounds enlisted in article 34 of the modern law are seen we all should appreciate what is being done in the domestic courts no matter how pro arbitration you want your arbitration to look or how pro arbitration you want your courts to look is it not true that even after contesting a full fledged case in arbitral tribunal again at the time of section 34 we really take it every issue it might be true that there are n number of judgments which suggest that courts are not allowed to reappreciate the evidence relook into the evidences right the are not supposed to substitute its mind the question is is it practically being followed if not then again you have given a door to one of the parties that okay no problem 
you again go to the enforcement proceedings, right? And again, you can invoke Article 5. What is the big fun? There are few thresholds of Article 5, right? That's grounds list in grounds enlisted under Article 5 are exhaustive in nature, right? Courts cannot review the awards on its merits, right? Which is clearly not the case. We all know. If you are raising questions upon the arbitration agreements in a total different jurisdiction, don't you think your lawyer would argue material facts? Obviously, she, she will. The question is, where do we put a bar? See, the burden of proving the existence of a refusal grounds rests on the party opposing the enforcement. Very clear, cleverly, the Article 5 suggests the burden of proof will be on the party resisting the arbitration award. The point is, why? You have already discharged your burden, or you have. it is expected that you have contested your case during the setting aside proceedings. Then why do you want to raise such disputes again during the course of proceedings enlisted in enforcement of the awards? The question, the, the, my limited query over here is, can executing court behind, go behind a decree? No matter how perverse it is, no matter. Section 34, you, you, had, you had Article 34 proceedings, right? You could have contested your case with full passion, not just because you are unsuccessful over there. You have, came, you, you have to roll, uh, raise such disputes over here again. And mind you, that is not the end. That is not the end. It goes beyond such limits. Right? They also suggest the, the limited application of Article 5 also suggests the grounds enlisted in Article 5 should construed very narrowly. Right? Now let's examine what Article 5 in totality is. Article 5 1. Right? How you should understand how it's how it starts. It says recognition and enforcement of award may be refused. Right? It uses the word may be. And please highlight this word maybe because it's the reason why there are contradictory opinion present in today's world. You are saying a recognition and enforcement of the award may be refused at the request of the party against whom it is invoked only if that party furnishes to the competent authority whether recognition and enforcement is sought. Right? Prove that. Article 5A. What Article 5A suggests? The parties to the agreement referred to in Article 2 were, were under the law applicable to them under some incapacity or the said agreement is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it or failing any indication thereon under the law of the country where the award was made. Now, if you look into Article 34, it will look almost similar. Are you suggesting that the court at the seat is inferior to the court at enforcement at the at the place of enforcement? Is this what we will call a committee between courts? Is this a rule of law we want to establish? Or is this the mutual respect we want to give to the courts? But no matter what the courts at the seat during the course of setting aside application have gone through, again on the same grounds, we will listen, listen we will listen the grief party at a time of enforcement. Is it not will it not fall under the relitigation of issues at hand? Now if we come to 5B. The party against whom the award is made, uh, the, the, sorry, the party against whom the award is invoked 
was not given a proper notice of the appointment of the arbitrator or of the arbitration proceedings or was otherwise unable to present his case right if we break it down a court may refuse to enforce the award if the party resisting enforcement proves that its due process rights were violated or it was not given a proper notice of appointment of arbitrator right or of the arbitration proceedings if the respondent is not given a proper notice of arbitration it will naturally be unable to present its case right the point is a <clears throat> you have contested a full fledged arbitration if not right you could have very well contested the case you could have very well made out this particular challenge before the arbitral tribunal or during the arbitration proceedings in the respective courts right then again you could have moved to section uh, to article 34 proceedings right but that's fine that's that's not the end you will again be given an opportunity in the course of section uh, article uh, uh, article 5 proceedings okay right? now i want to put one question the practical difficulty in the practical difficulties the logistical nightmare for example and it might sound a very trivial issue a very small issue but understand the logistical differences for example your entire arbitration proceedings was conducted in for example in england right you know you had a seat in england obviously the parties agree by the fact have moved to a seat for challenging the particular arbitration award then at that particular seat the entire arbitral record was summoned from the arbitrators to the court right whatever the fate would be then again suppose the awards were to be enforced for example in india or for example in singapore right then if you if the courts at enforcement are again looking towards due process procedure the principles of national justice then again you will be needing at that particular arbitral record how will you carry out such things the practical difficulty will you or will you not be will you not be would you not be wasting the precious time of the courts the courts will again look at the entire voluminous documents the question the very simple question is why why are we supposed to do such things how we will develop an effective arbitration regime if we are not giving a final end to an arbitration proceedings if we see article 5c right the award deals with a difference not contemplated by or not falling within the terms of submission to arbitration or it contains decision on matters beyond the scope of the submission to the arbitration provided that if the decision on matters submitted to arbitration can be separated from those not so submitted that part of the award which contains decision on matters submitted to arbitration may be recognized in force again the question is why you are bothered to do so a very simple see understand let's let's see it through a very narrow design for an instance we all have civil courts in our respective jurisdiction we contest a suit suppose a party wins the suit subsequently a the the, the losing party will may prefer an appeal and winning party obviously will go for an enforcement will the courts at enforcement will look into such aspects such minute aspects then if the answer is yes then obviously we are making a framework which suggests that look boss there is no end to it we will keep on litigating 
then if you directly come to <coughs> sorry article 5d right the composition of arbitral authority or the arbitral procedure was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties or failing such an agreement was not in accordance with the law of the country where the arbitration took place right if we break it down article 51d enables the court to refuse the enforcement if the arbitrator's appointment or the arbitral procedure was not in accordance with the arbitration agreement the methods of appointing the members of the tribunals are often set out and are often set out in the arbitration agreement courts may make use of their residual discretion to enforce the award if the irregularity did not affect the outcome of the arbitration court may also rely on the principle of estoppel further if we say the enforcement can be granted not withstanding an irregularity in the composition of tribunal or arbitral procedure if the regularity is qualified right as a technical deficiency without an effect on the ultimate outcome a you are saying that okay the courts will look into it but the courts will also set a bar that if any materiality is not affected or the final outcome of the case is not affected then it's fine the point is how can you say that the courts at the seed have not look up, looked upon these aspects if the courts at the seeds have already looked upon these aspects then why are why the courts and enforcements are supposed to give their second opinion is it an appeal of setting aside can we say that enforcement proceedings as per the new york conventions are nothing but an appeal of section uh, of article 34 proceedings the answer to that is unequivocal no you have to respect you have to give prominence to the courts who are supposed to perform such a task right why in arbitration proceeding there is so much of relevance of seed why for example let's let's break it down to for for everyone's understanding suppose for example ali over here is attending a this webinar ali is an arbit ali is an arbitrator right and ali is arbitrating dispute between mr ahmed and mr ajha right and mr ahmed suppose is from india and mr ajha is from singapore this particular and the seat of this particular arbitration is london is the arbitrator is supposed to give an award in conformity with the public policy where both the parties are situated or in suppose for example in n number of jurisdictions they have assets is arbitrators is 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 the question is is arbitrators duty bound to look towards public policy of all the possible places where the where a winning party would file for enforcement is it even lo logically possible or the arbitrator is only supposed to look at the public policy aspect of the seat which is more logically favorable logic and possible if we are going towards all those aspects no arbitrator is supposed to look at the public policy of places where the parties have their assets or are we suggesting that no where the parties have their place of business the arbitrator should should look towards the public policy of that particular place can it be done answer to that is no then <clears throat> if we move a little ahead right the award if we look towards e part of it the award has not yet become binding on the parties or has been set aside what does article 5b e suggest the award has not yet become binding on the parties or has been set aside or suspended by a competent authority of the country in which or under the law of which the award was made 
Now understand. Article 51E suggests the award has not yet become binding on the parties or has been set aside or suspended by a competent authority. That particular award. Now, if we read the head note of Article 51, it suggests may be refused. Are, is this New York Convention giving a window to the fact that even if your award is set aside, the courts may or may not enforce it? What kind of a proposition would it be? Even an award which is set aside is okay for enforcement. Right? That is where the core dispute rise, lies. Right? Under, under Article 51 of the New York Convention, the refusal of the recognition and enforcement of the international award is limited to five circumstances. Right? The enamelment of award by the court of the seat is one of the five. What are the three prominent grounds have been established under Article 51E? A. The award has not yet become binding. B. The award has been suspended. Or C. The award has been set aside. Okay. One area of uncertainty through, though involves the question of whether and in what circumstances an award annulled at the C is capable of being recognized and enforced by a secondary court. To resolve this particular issue, there are various opinions. There are very diverse opinions, right? French courts, especially French jurisprudence, has, for example, has held that the fact that an award has been set aside in the country of origin, right? The fact that the award is being, if the award is set aside at the seat, is entirely irrelevant for the French courts. Right? right, and they can even the French courts can even recognize such an award and enforce such an award. Contrary, the what if a party tries to enforce enforce an annulled award before the Spanish courts, there is a high chance that this recognition and enforcement will be refused. French court is saying we are okay with the setting a set aside award. We will enforce it. We can recognize it. Spanish court is saying no worse. There are very high chances that your award will not be enforced. Right? Then comes the question. Then comes the basic debate. The supporters of the literalism view of the word used in Article 5.1, that is May. Right? That is May. Who understand that New York Convention leaves enough room to the national courts to determine their own annulment grounds, acknowledging the viability of enforcing an annulled arbitral award, right? Award and those that insist on the impossibility of recognizing and enforcing the award annulled by the court. Basically, the courts who are of the view that if the award is set aside, if the award is annulled, it ceases to exist. Right? There is no award if the award has already been set aside by the court at the seat. Right? According to few scholars, right, when the New York Convention was drafted, it was very clear that an award annulled by the court of the seat could not be enforced in any country, irrespective of anything. Right? Because technically it will be considered that it is against the public policy of the seat. Therefore, the award is of the any of the ground. The award is incapable of being enforcement when the, once the award is set aside. Right? Then there are few who suggest that arbitral awards belongs to and is a product of a particular legal system. Right? Now you can relate why I said that and of how many places the arbitrator is supposed to look towards the public policy aspect. Right? Give me a minute. Right. 
See, the provisions of national law and its decision of the national courts, as a result, the courts of the seat is not only the most suitable court, but also the only court able to render a decision on the correct conduct of an arbitration proceedings, which took place within its territory. And that is very true. If suppose an arbitration is being is, is seated, suppose in US, right? The arbitrator is supposed to look towards the public policy aspect of that particular country. That award is not towards upon looking toward these aspects, right? If we go delve in, in further, right? What are the repercussions of such a diverse opinion, right? If we allow the set uh, the annulled award being enforced, what are the repercussions of that? A, it is cost and time consuming both, right? As long as the party that obtained the favorable award pursues enforcement in every jurisdiction, right? Whether the party has assets, the cost, uh, the, you will, you can ascertain the cost, right? I will go to n number of places and seek enforcement. I will say, okay, the award is uh, award is against the public policy of suppose for of India. Then I will uh, if, then I I can go to Singapore. If the, if, it, if it is against the public policy of Singapore, then again I will go to the uh, I will go to England. If if I find the award is against the public policy of England, then again I will go to US. And there is no end to it. There is no end to it. Right. Be as uncertainty between the parties. Right? The party that obtained the annulment will never be certain as to when the dispute will finally end. Right? Finality and closure of such a dispute will never be reached. Right? Never. Ultimately, the party is having lost in the award, but having managed to have it annulled at the seat, would feel forced to reach into a settlement in order to avoid the earlier to discuss consequences. Right? If that happens, the arbitration and the enforcement proceedings would have will, will technically serve no purpose. Right? If we see, if we draw a parallel over here, the national court decisions in France, Belgium, and Austria, right? They are of the view that annul, the award annulled by an arbitral seat may in some circumstances be enforced, right? But there are other countries. Who have reached to a conclusion that no, you cannot do so. That you cannot do so. Right? The finality of an arbitral award is one of the distinctive features of the arbitration that makes it attractive to parties seeking efficient, effective, and timely resolution of disputes. Right? There are technically three approaches. Right? There are technically three approaches: A territorial approach, B delocalized approach, and C assessment approach. Right? What does territorial approach suggest? It gives full effect to the set aside decision, relies on the idea that once an award is set aside, it ceases to exist. This means that an arbitral award is set aside, it is contrary to the public policy of the court of the enforcement, it, it can never be enforced again. Right? Then there is a delocalized approach. It rests on the idea that arbitral awards are detached from the state of origin. They are even saying that no matter where the award was passed, it is detached. De right? It's a delocalized. And the court of enforcement has a discretion based on the permissive language. And what is the permissive language? That the use of word may. Right? They have given a discretion that the use of word may. Right? The New York Convention will, will disregard the set aside of the law and obviously they can move on or move on with their own public policy. Then it comes the assessment approach. Right? It appears to have gained significant visibility in recent years. Right? Few suggest that unless the awards are set aside based on the internationally recognized grounds, such awards should not be refused enforcement to other countries. Now understand the logistical nightmare. Right? If we go by the assessment approach, you are suggesting that there has to be certain internationally there. So like, suppose we have. IBA guidelines, for example, on conflict of interest, which are the best practices are being adopted throughout the uh, throughout the globe. The countries can adopt such in guidelines. Now, if we go by such contradictory stances, are you suggesting that an award 
for setting aside of an award, you need to have certain threshold, internationally accepted threshold. Can it be done? How can public policy of each and every country be seen? Some countries are today are pro-arbitration. Some countries are today are still <laughs> developing their jurisprudence. How one approach can be adopted as of today? The answer to that is still in ambiguity. Now, when I started this webinar, I posed the question, right? Do we need NYC anymore? If you are saying that every courts, the, the, the courts at the enforcement and the legislative framework of the enforcing courts would look into the awards. And why we should have NYC just because of reciprocity or just because it helped us to devise a mechanism. If we are saying that irrespective of the NYC, we will have one uh, we will have the courts at this uh, the courts at the enforcement the enforcement courts or next like courts will look into the awards again and what is the big fun right so are we suggesting that nyc is now only a tool for location of assets right? we need to understand a the court at the place of enforcement are not the appellate court. If the courts at setting aside, the courts who are hearing the petition for setting aside are already considering all the grounds, then why are you again during the section 36 proceeding or article 30, uh, or sorry, article 5 proceedings are again coming who hear on such particular disputes? Is it not repetitions? Is it not relitigation? Is it not unnecessary undue harassment? Is it not, will it not be a tool for a judgment debtor to, to harass award holder? How we will answer such questions? So, no matter how pro we look on the front of arbitration, you have to also be a pro enforcement regime. You cannot be a pro arbitration regime until and unless you have an effective mechanism which ensures effective enforcement. Because end of the day, parties in arbitrations, what are they? They are the business houses. Right? They are doing business. They are the commercial parties who are doing globally, who are globally doing their businesses. They have a dispute. They want effective, effective, and see more than any other thing, they want an assurance. Why you we need to understand why the parties have bestowed their trust on the arbitration mechanism. Why parties have the attached themselves from the court litigations and, and have come and are resorting now towards all these arbitration mechanism. We have to upheld, uphold such trust. And that can only be achieved when we give them an effective enforcement mechanism. When we give them an approach, okay boss, you we will see, we I am not suggesting that the courts that you can go and enforce against the public policy of X nation. No, I'm not suggesting that. The point is we should refrain from giving n number of opportunities again and again. Because you need to understand if we are not sealing the leakages, we are providing avenues. Right? With that, on that note, I humbly conclude my submissions. Right? Thank you so much for your kind patience. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out. Like, please feel free to convey your questions. I'll be most happy to take your questions. Thank you Thank very you much, much, Mr. Ankit Singh.
We are truly grateful for the time you have taken to join and enlighten us. Before we let Mr. Ankit Singh go, if anybody has any questions, they are free to unmute themselves and ask the question. There are a few questions in the chat box currently as well. I will read them one by one. Uh, the first question is, ADR can do with no registration or a term that says it's allowed to go arbitration of any jurisdiction. See, when we opt for an arbitration mechanism, right? And as NYC also says, there, is, there has to be an arbitration and the arbitration agreement should be in writing, right? And every, and even in model law, even model law provides that your arbitration agreement has to be in writing, right? There is no bar of jurisdiction. You can approach, you can see, you can have two start, uh, two ways how arbitration, how you can approach arbitration. A, if you have already have a arbitration agreement prior to disputes, like you are negotiating a contract, you have very well, you have very well incorporated a dispute resolution clause where you have an arbitration agreement. Second, which is called submission agreements, where after the dispute, both the parties come to a conclusion that, okay, we don't want to go to court. We will resort to arbitration. That's one way of look at it, looking at it, right? Second question is, for example, company A in Maldives made a contract to deliver a system, a software with company B in India. Company B has no assets in Maldives, neither company A has no assets in India. So if any dispute and the court can freeze from either company. This is the beauty of New York Convention. Apart from every, the digressing view I have taken, this is the beauty. For enforcement, you can go to any country. The only condition is you need to be a signatory of New York Convention. Suppose, for example, you have assets in US, right? You can file for enforcement in US, right? And the courts will take a definitive call, call over there. It is not a bar, right? right? Any other question, please? I think that's all. Once again, thank you very much, Mr. Ankitson. With that, we have reached the end of our webinar. Thank you all for joining and we hope to see you in our next webinar. We will let you know the date. And uh, I, think there is one, I think there is one more uh, questions. That I'm really sorry, Suman. That means that the contract must have a clause on your convention. See, over here the point is, if the parties are international, right? You, we need to understand when this enforcement by way of New York Convention would come into place, right? If the parties are international, then by default, by the way of recognition, we have to go for New York Convention. We, because earlier there was a Geneva Convention, later on we've moved to a New York Convention design. If the parties are international, irrespective of the fact whether you incorporate in your... See, you need to understand you cannot have a clause we suggest that, okay, you cannot enforce by this, right? For every, why parties do come to arbitration proceedings. Okay. What might be uh, the real benefit of Singapore two different conventions? Uh, if Mr. Akram, I, uh, please could you rephrase your question? Yes, parties may also agree to the application of the unsettled arbitration and disability as a result of the I think there's one very interesting questions. Like, see, we need to understand that there is a principle in arbitration which is called as party autonomy. Right? What is party autonomy? Party's autonomy means it is party's prerogative how they want to do their arbitration proceedings. Right? During the course of negotiation, right? They choose themselves, like, okay, boss, I want to have one particular institution, right? And one particular set of rules to be applicable upon my disputes. That's why we call it, it's a tailored, tailored process. Arbitration is a tailored process, right? You can have your own set of rules. You can have your own set of arbitrators. You can have your own even rule of evidences. Right? And then again, you can you can proceed and commence your arbitration. The relevance of C 
if we see why is the element of seed is important for the very simple reason that you need a court for assistance so the courts to have just a supervisory jurisdiction okay the parties are free to do their arbitrations but there is a court at the seat which will look why suppose for example one of the parties not leading the evidence so you can take help from the court suppose you want to one of the parties not appointing the arbitrators you can approach to a seat and ask the party to ask the court to kindly make my arbitrator right these are all the supervisory jurisdiction which are, which are vested with the courts right and therefore you can have any law any seat any institution and have your arbitration right that is the beauty of party autonomy all right right so yeah Once again, thank you very much, Mr. Ankit Singh. With that, we have reached the end of our webinar. Thank you all for joining, and we Hello. hope to see you in our next webinar. We will let you know the de details of the next webinar in the upcoming month. So follow us on our social media handles and check our website, which you can find in the chat box. Again, thank you all very much, and have a good Manna. day, everyone. Sumana, sorry, just a minute. Okay. Yeah, yes. I got a question in the in the chat box. All right, let me see. Yes. <clears throat> I want to understand more about the the appointment of arbitrators, where you are appointing them, maybe on an emergence uh, as an emergence uh, emergence arbitrators. Okay. Does decisions on um on changes to to arbitrators, uh, differ? according to uh, how you appoint them let's say if it is an emergency appointment then how do you also get to uh, replace them um, let's say an arbitrator is no longer uh, participating on uh, on a certain uh, let's say panel how do you replace those arbitrators then i also want to understand the fund fund holding services um, uh, in that regard right so when we talk about appointment of arbitrators right there are few methods to it if see when you, whenever you draft a contract or whenever you are negotiating a contract you put a very specific mandate over there whether it will be a sole arbitrator appointed by the mutual consent of the parties or it's a tribunal one arbitrator will be appointed by either of the parties and both the parties uh, and both the and both of those arbitrators would respect, respectively choose the president of the tribunal or president uh, or the presiding arbitrator right? this is one way suppose for example either of the parties are not reaching into a consensus with respect to the arbitrator then what will they will do if it's an institutional arbitration obviously the institution will appoint that particular arbitrator and if it's not an institutional arbitration and it is an ad hoc arbitration then parties would technically approach the domestic courts the courts at the seat and take the help of the court file an application uh, for appointment of arbitrator and subsequently the courts will appoint an arbitrator now coming to the second part of your question with respect to the emergency of our emergency arbitrators right there has recently in india there has been a very big fiasco with respect to amazon dispute where we dealt heavily with respect to the emergency arbitrators right even in the cases of emergency arbitrators some of the institutional arbitration institutional arbitration rules provide for emergency arbitrators now we have to understand what is the emergency arbitrator the emergency arbitrator is nothing but till the time you are suppose for example you have invoked the arbitration proceedings and there is a process to your appointment of arbitrators and you are if you are anticipating a prejudice prejudice effectively and you want an effective remedy right okay your remedy cannot could not wait till the point point of appointment of arbitrator then you can take the help from emergency arbitrator your clause your agreement your dispute resolution clause can also can also have a clause with respect to appointment of emergency arbitrators or in either case if you have adopted for example ciac rules it has the provision for appointment of emergency arbitrators and then and there the, the institution will appoint the emergency arbitrators 
it will have the prima facie view of, upon your disputes and accordingly a dispute can be resolved uh, a, a effective and immediate remedy can be rendered to you right now comes the question with respect to replacement of arbitrators right replacement are of two types a either you are challenging the independent impartiality of the arbitrators right or you are saying that your arbitrators your de- has become de facto de jure or he is not performing he is not performing its uh, uh, its functions right if you are saying that your arbitrator is independent is if your arbitrator lacks independence and impartiality right there are n number of rules we suggest that you have to move such kind of an application a before the arbitrator and within uh, with, with, before the tribunal and say like look boss i i have no faith in you right because because of the schedule uh, with respect to the we have ib guidelines on conflict of interest we have the red red list we have the green uh, we, we have the blue uh, red list orange list and green list i guess right where the n number of grounds have been postulated if you think that your arbitrator fits in one criteria it, it is good for having him removed right suppose for example that you have your arbitrator is not conducting your proceedings in a proper pro- proper manner then subsequently you can move to a court and suggest that look boss i have no faith in my arbitration and the, that particular guy guy is also not vacating his office so please appoint me please substitute my arbitrator that can also be done but that is a very rare case right suppose for an example in between your arbitration proceeding something unfortunate happens like right? or if arbitrator recuses himself then again you can approach the respective forum and have your arbitrator arbitrator replaced right now we need to understand when you can bring such a challenge to an arbitration your with respect to your arbitrators there are various threshold one you when we look into the exit part of it right earlier exit has stricter stricter restrictions you have to prove but lately with this uh, ancestral and other domestic laws have taken a justifiable grounds even if it appears that arbitrator lacks independence in, uh, in impartiality in the eyes of a third person it is a sufficient ground to challenge him you don't have to prove the actual bias now if it, even if it prima facie appears it is fine right i hope i have answered your questions it seems there are a lot of questions but uh due to lack of time we have to finish the webinar uh you can email us any more questions you have to our email which you can find in the chat box so again thank you so much and have a good day everyone thank you so much guys thank you so much